Thanks everybody for coming. I'm Mike Caldwell. That's a very small group, so I'm just we'll make this pretty informal. Uh, the goal for today is really to familiarize you with uh, financial models for startups. And this can be a traditional startup, it can be a tech startup, it really doesn't matter. The, the basics are the same. Um, there is a financial model that I give away online called Startup Models. We'll be using that uh, today. You're welcome to download it for free. It's out there for you. It is really focused on, hey, come on in. I started so that I could pick on you when you got here. Great. Yeah. You're, you're perfect at doing the welcome slides. <laughs> uh, so it is focused more on software as a service companies. I will tell you that, but it also is so suitable for hardware companies. So any kind of uh, physical product or service is fine. Uh, a lot of the subjects you'll hear about is reoccurring revenue, which is very much more on the service side of the world. And hopefully answer questions you have. So we're not going to go, this isn't going to be like number crunching, it's going to be more examples and talk about stories. So hopefully uh, this can be a bit of a dry subject. I'm going to do everything I can to make it not dry. Uh, so as a starter, probably the driest part of this is really three financial products or documents everybody wants to see. And I'm going to speak to you today as an investor. My wife and I are angel investors. We've made 25 angel investments. Um, and I'm going to speak to you as an investor because that's usually a lot of the audience you're writing these things for. You're putting them together because you need to raise money or you need to go to the bank. Now, you should be writing them also for your own sake, but people tend to do it for different motivations. So P&L, cash flow statement on a balance sheet. So real briefly, um, you got to have them because, number one, we need to know if you're going to make money. All right, you have an expectation of making money. And this is where you go from the idea stage down to the details of what this actually make money. Come on in. Sorry. Sorry. That's my that's not me. That way you can see, right? Can't get any closer, guys. No, you can't, Chris. Uh, does your company have enough cash to survive and thrive? This is, it used to be the number one reason businesses failed was cash, running out of cash. Actually, these days, it's profit market fit. Companies tend to find out their products don't fit before they run out of cash. We can, we're not going to get into that too much today, but just to be aware, cash is still one of the key reasons. And when we're talking about product, we're going to talk about different reasons cash runs out than we're talking about services. They're very different business models, but we'll address both. So long development cycles for uh, software, large inventories for hardware, uh, long sell cycles. And then finally, for an investor, what's your company worth? Because as a bank, I want to make sure that I'm lending money to something that's going to be established and have value. As an investor, if I'm an angel investor, I'm looking for a very high rate of return. Um, so all these are reasons to have them. Uh, banks are looking for bankable loans with low risk. Uh, we did a capital for your business seminar. The simple answer is banks will make you mortgage your house. Just that's the way it is. That's what they do. Uh, unless what you're borrowing for has more value than you're borrowing, which is pretty uncommon. Equity investors like myself are looking for a return of 10x or more. Now, that sounds crazy. Why should I give you 10 times your money back? But here's the reason. If I make 10 investments in startups, I'm a reasonably educated angel investor now. I've learned my lessons. Um, if I make 10 $50,000 investments over, let's say, a one-year period, three years later, eight of those companies will disappear. I'm out $400,000. So my original half million, I've got 100K left. The ninth company will probably return my money, not much more. Okay, so now I got 50 grand left and 450 out, it's year five, and I've got this $50,000 investment. If I don't get 10X, I'm actually gonna lose money, but I won't make the return in the stock market. I could have put my $500,000 in the stock market and given, assuming 08 didn't happen in the middle of that, I probably would have had quite a bit more by the end of those five, six years, maybe another $150,000 or so. So understand that that's why angel investors are looking for such a high return. Come on in. That's why angel investors are looking for such a high return, is because most of these things do fail. Now, failure doesn't mean the business is gone. There's something called a zombie business. And real simple, what it is, is I'm gonna pick, I love to pick up people. Mason starts a software company, I put some money in his deal. And what happens five years down the road, Mason realizes he's got a really good business. It pays him very well. It's really not worth much more than what his salary is every year, but it's paying him a nice salary. He's got these investors. They own a minority of the company. There's no way he's ever going to sell for anything of substance. And so I still have this on my list of assets, but it really isn't worth anything. 
he's got a company that's existing and thriving for him, but nobody else. That's not a horrible outcome for him, but for me as an investor, I'll never see a dime back. It's just, it's just the truth of the matter. So those are some of the reasons. Um, software as a service companies uh, are returning a valuation. Uh, this was just an example. So if you've got a company with revenue of 7.2 million and you get a 7x valuation, which is pretty common, meaning it's worth seven times its revenue, um, that's a $50 million value. Uh, that's a pretty good number for me to get back the five million I need to make up for the 500,000, if you see what I'm saying. Exit must take place in five to seven years. This is, so if you're going out looking for equity capital, don't talk about a 10 or 20 year return. That's not what they're looking for. They're expecting their return in five to seven years. Um, and this, if any of you have been following the fiasco of WeWork going public, or WeCorp, whatever they call it this week, uh, the investors are expecting their money back. They put some of the money in at a $47 billion valuation. The IPO got pulled yesterday or today because they're down to a $10 billion valuation and investors still aren't interested in it. So there's going to be a pretty big mess in, in that. But that's why they're wanting it to take place because now it's like we may, we work maybe hanging out there for another 5, 10, 15 years. Well, that's not a good sign for the investors. So let's go to the PL statement. What is it? Real simple. PL statements are a monthly and yearly statement to very much say how much money did we bring in in revenue? What was the cost of providing that revenue? Um, if you are, have cost of goods directly in the sense of physical product, even in the software world, there's cost of goods that are associated with delivering software as a service. Gross margin means what's left after I pay the direct cost of those sales. And that's why I like to think of cost of revenue. What's the cost directly of providing that sale? Uh, Christina in the back has a bakery. The cost of the ingredients and all the wrappings and paper and boxes are there. Her cost of goods, her rent is not. Okay. Gross margin is what's left to pay all the operating expenses of the business. Heat, light, utilities, people's pay, all those things. It gets down to a profit or a loss. Um, when you're building, this is a place where you really need to spend a lot of time thinking through what you're doing. You want to invest the time and effort to get a, re a, a detailed model, realistic. And we'll talk about some of the reasons, what, what makes it realistic, but I'll give you an example. If you're in the uh, retail world, don't tell me your sales in January are the same as they were in December. Because retail dies in January because everybody's spent all their money at Christmas time. So it's a very seasonal business. If you're in the ag business, don't show me a lot of revenue in July because farmers are in the field. They're not going to talk to you. They don't want you anywhere near them in July. They want to buy in the spring and the fall. So really in realistic assumptions is the point. Um, I'm going to say it later on. I'll say it again here. We know these are going to be wrong. Just go into this knowing your estimates aren't exactly right. What we want to know as investors and bankers is what are the assumptions you're using? Where did you get the I'm going to sell 100 units next month or I'm going to sell three customers in the first 90 days? Where did that come from? I'll even go as far as say, what are the names? Who are those three customers in the next 90 days? The first 12 to 18 months really needs to be supported. It doesn't. It can't just be fantasy land. It can't be, well, I think this is going to happen. Uh, if you're going to open a restaurant somewhere and you say 200 customers are going to show up every night for the first 30 nights, the bank's going to laugh you out of the room. If you say, well, I put my game out on the app store and I'm assuming 100 people a day will buy it. Not without a whole lot of marketing to support it. Uh, three or forecast is normally sufficient. You're good. Some people are going to ask you for five years. Seems crazy. But what they're trying to figure out is what you aspire to. What's this business going to be? If you're a software company, are you trying to be a $50 million company? Are you trying to be a $500 million company? What is it you're trying to do? Some investors want to bet on very big outcomes. It's what they want. It's the, in the Valley right now, it's called the, you know, they talk about unicorn companies. Companies are going to get a billion dollar valuation. Um, don't necessarily agree with that, that thought that everything has to be a unicorn, but just understand that different investors have different expectations. If you're not interested in a billion dollar company, that investor may not be a good fit for you. So in your book, and this is why you have printouts in front of you, because you can't read this on the screen. Uh, it's too small, pipe, but this is an actual software as a service, uh, artificial data. Everything in here is artificial data, so nobody's real numbers are in here. But this is what it really looks like. And if you look down the column on the left, you're going to see things like three different kinds of revenue. In this case, we list subscription software revenue, product revenue, and professional services revenue. Professional services would be somebody came out and installed the product you bought. In the software world, they may have done an installation or integration, that type of thing. 
All these cost of goods that are listed down there, third-party transaction fees, credit cards. If you're selling in, in the on the online world, you're probably paying a credit card fee. If you've got a retail store, you're paying a credit card fee. Hosting expenses for software, customer support, engineering support if you've got uh, a software product. Uh, professional services costs, what it costs to provide those professional services. And then cost of product, what it costs to build your product. If, you, if you've got a physical product, obviously if you're selling a device. Comes down to cost of goods and the gross profit, the gross margin. Operating expenses, we're looking at a very high level. Just sales expense, marketing expense, product development, and then those general administrative expenses, which are things like rent, phones, legal expense, banking fees, all the things you absolutely have to have to do business, but they don't really associate to any specific area. <clears throat> a cash flow statement, pretty similar, but what we're looking at here is how much money we have in the bank. In an early stage company, this is the first and foremost thing I'm looking at all the time, it's where's my cash flow. Because again, running out of money is not a good idea. So basically, starting cash, how much did you have in the bank at the very beginning of the month? Did you bring in any new investment? Did you have any revenues? Expenses, this includes every expense, product expenses, everything. Cash at the end of the month. Do you have more at the end of the month or, or less? Here's an example on the next page of what that looks like. So real simple, uh, going down the, the left side. How much did I start with? How much revenue came in? What was my cost of selling that? those products or services? What are operating expenses I have? Any other incomes? This can be just about anything. Somebody gives you a grant, you win a prize. By the way, if you win the business plan prize, like Papa John's prize just got awarded for $40,000, guess what? It's revenue and you get to pay taxes on it. So just free money is still taxed. Um, any new investments coming in, then an ending cash balance, and you'll see that it shows change of cash. And you know, this is again fictional data, but you're seeing mostly, you know, the parentheses means it went down, but you're seeing it mostly go up. There's positive cash, you're adding cash or that's a great place to be. So when you're putting together your profit and loss, your, your forecast, it's building the cash flow for you. Uh, I can't say enough about this. I won't waste your time just like beating on all these points because I could spend an hour on good cash flow management. Um, in the interview process, whether it's at a bank or whether you're talking to investors, we care about how well you manage cash because it's our cash too, not just yours. So we're really going to be interested in how much attention you spend to cash and have since you started your business and will going forward. And looking at your forecast, you know, are you hiring in advance of your need? Are you really thinking about when you need to apply these expenses? So uh, lots of things in here. Honestly, I've got uh, one of my investments, the CEO of the company just went without a salary for a year. She had to. She paid her people. But as founders, you get paid last. And it's an expectation that if you're short, you don't pay yourself. As an investor, that's my expectation of you, is if you're short, you don't pay yourself. Or you pay yourself enough to cover the house payment, and that's it if you're that short on money. And there's some younger founders that don't have a lot of finances. We get that. But it, this is ramen noodle money. This isn't, uh, I can lease my BMW and go to the club and all those kinds of things. You're going to hear the word burn rate a lot. There's a glossary in here. I probably forgot to put burn rate in there. I hope I did put it in. but. Um, burn rate means how much cash do you burn through every month? What's the average month's burn rate? If on average you spend, when we go back to this P&L statement, you can go across the bottom and look at the total expenses and see that it's 10,000, 22, 16, 15, 15, 27, 20, da, 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 you look across there. By the end of the year, she's, she's burning about $20,000 a month in cash. That's her burn rate. It's what you expect to spend per month. So um, know your burn rate, and you've got to know this in detail. This is the report you're looking at. A, a good operator looks at this every day. They know their cash position every day. Once you get rolling and things are good, you'll have a big cash bubble, and that's great. you got the cash in the bank, that's a wonderful place to be. But Chris is sitting here who has a lot of running in this firm, and I guarantee he has a really good idea of where his cash flow is. Christine in the back knows exactly where her cash flow is. There's just no question. You, you don't survive unless you know this. Balance sheet's the one you will not always get asked for. Some banks will ask for them, some won't. In a physical products company where you have assets, it's a really big deal. In a software company, I don't even look at it because the truth is the asset is the software and a few computers. I mean, 
What's in my backpack in the back is enough to start a software company. I don't need anything else. I can sit at the coffee shop, use their internet. I can sit at my home and do it. So these balance sheets are literally what are your assets, uh, what are the liabilities, and what's left over for the shareholder. It is that simple. So we won't spend a lot of time on that today. I do have a blog post in there that I found. The back of your book, a lot of what's in this book is like 40 pages of really good writings. So there's one called How to Read a, read a Balance Sheet, and it's kind of like balance sheets for dummies. It's a real simple read, because I've never been a balance sheet guy, so I don't really get into the details of balance sheet. Christina knows way more about them than I do, because she has to deal with them all the time. But this was a really nice piece of writing. If you want to understand it, it's a really easy read. Accounting statements are fact. They deal with the past and the present. They don't deal past, usually yesterday, at the, at the most. I mean, they're just, they're, they're history. That's what they are, history document. Financial models are forecasts. They're always wrong. They're always wrong. Go in there knowing they're wrong. But they're critical to planning. Uh, again, Christine in the back, if she's planning to do an expansion or she's going to add a new product line, she's going to make a really detailed forecast of what that's going to impact her business on. And she knows it's probably wrong, but what she's really doing is challenging herself on all of her assumptions, or Chris is doing the same here in the firm, to say, this is why I think this, and this is where the revenue should come out. And a good business operator will be close, unless we get a 9-11 or something crazy happens. But in, you know, in normal days, if you will, um, they're pretty close. Uh, and they're an ongoing requirement. I, I was in a company that went public. We did about a billion dollars a year in revenue. We had 5,000 employees. We constantly do this. You're always forecasting, forecasting, forecasting. We forecast our sales every 30 days. We forecast our expenses every 90 days. We did an annual budget. We did a five-year plan. It's just part of operating good business. And the closer you get to the business, the more you're going to want to do this. You'll actually find you really understand why you need to do it, and it's valuable. Uh, another good blog post there on the financial function. Uh, Fred Wilson's a very famous uh, venture capitalist, Union Square Ventures. They were one of the first invent investors in Douala. Uh, extremely respected and a great writer. His blog is one of the best out there. So just to summarize this whole fairly dry financial documents discussion, the documents really do matter. And as an investor or banker, if I have the feeling you're kind of giving them the brush off, you're probably done. We read them in detail, and I can tell you, I can look at somebody's financial model for about 30 minutes and tell you a whole lot about whether the company's in a good place or not, on a good track or not, or the person's been thoughtful or not. I don't know if they're right. I'm sure I don't know if they're right, but I can dig into the assumptions and see things like the exact same amount of revenue on every month, the exact same expense every month. It's just like there's so many tells in that. So. Um, have an experienced mentor or advisor review these with you before you present them to others. That's something that I do at the partnership. Christine and I both happen to work at the partnership. What we do, we do for free to people in central Iowa. So if you're trying to build one of these out, we're here for you. I tend to do the high growth potential startup kinds of businesses. Christine focuses on Main Street businesses, but we're both here for you. We have other resources that can help you too. But don't, don't practice on your banker or your investor. Practice on somebody that's going to give you some really great feedback and get you ready. We even go to the point Chris said on one of these the other day where we had somebody presenting for angel investment to a group of four investors in a practice session. Can't always pull that together, but when we can, we do. Get comfortable with your financials, know the lingo, know where, you, know where your numbers are. Um, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about your numbers. I don't expect you to know the detail, but I do expect you to kind of understand the high levels of your numbers without having to look at the numbers. It's, it's, the numbers are a reflection of the business you're building. They're not separate from that business. They are a part of that business. And they are a fundamental of it. And don't pretend. If you don't know, say, you know what, I don't know, let me go find out. There's nothing worse than getting caught when somebody starts going down a road and it's like, yeah, obviously don't know. So building your financial models, I put it into five steps. And this is just my way of looking at it. But it starts with a revenue model, and this is where almost all the work is going to be for you, especially if you're building a business that's more of a software or high growth potential business, or you're selling a lot of product online or through retail stores or whatever. Most of this is going to be about how you're going to make money. The other pieces tend to fall out pretty straightforward. Product development is the second one. If you're doing a physical product, this can get really expensive, although I know software companies that go through $10 million in product development too. It happens. Sales and marketing expenses to support this, general and operational, operation, operating expenses for things like places for people to work, and then people. And people, you're kind of ticking the list all as you go along, but I recommend you kind of hold off the whole how much they're going to cost till the end. 
you're really trying to figure out what it is you're going to do first, what you need, and then who are the people I need to do this after you dump the what. So let's start with the first part, the revenue model. Um, it drives pretty much everything else. If you're in a physical products company, it's really about cash cycle. Cash cycle, real simply, is from the day I start spending money to get a customer or sell a product, how long till I get my money back? If you're selling software online, direct costs, zero, right? You've got a gaming company. Jesse has a gaming company. If he just sells one more game copy, no cost of goods. If I'm selling a product, we're going to talk about Amos's uh, company, Fairpro, it's a physical product that goes onto a farm. He's about 90 days in advance of the sale when he first starts spending money and doesn't get paid sometimes until 90 days after the sale. So it is a six month cash cycle. Walmart is notorious. We've got an example in here today about Walmart that we'll go through. On the software company, you're focused on the sell cycle. Um, app Store, we're going to talk about an App Store app today. We're also going to talk about a, a company here in town that has as much as an 18 month sell cycle from first contact. By the way, first contact where the customer says, I'm really interested in your product to the time she gets a check can be as much as 18 months. So you've got to understand that sell cycle. All right, so we're going to go through two software examples, and we're going to go through two hardware examples today. And we, I promise we'll take breaks, because I know this gets kind of thick. Um, if you have any questions, please stop me. This hopefully is where it gets much more interesting than, than the, why you need a state stuff. Clinic Note is founded by an ISU grad. It's a software as a service company. And then I, that's a real company that's here in Des Moines. Uh, sports knowledge is something I've made up. So just know that uh, even when I'm talking to you about Clinic Note, all the numbers are false. I do know their numbers, these aren't them. Uh, I think a few things are real, like their average customer value, but everything else is just made up stuff. Uh, so let's talk about Clinic Note. It's a software product for speech language pathologists. People who help people with speech impediments, damage speech, people who are coming back from a stroke and have to get to relearn their, their uh, language skills. Uh, it's a pretty interesting world. It's totally different than most other medical type situations because it's a reoccurring, you go in for therapy every week kind of thing or every month. And so the insurance needs are very different, the reporting needs are different, and that's what drove them to develop this product. So they're basically an electronic healthcare record for speech language pathologists. So they have two markets. Interesting thing that they did was they sell to universities because the universities are teaching speech language pathology with paper records. The problem with that is they actually have real clinics. They serve real patients. Well, there's this law called HIPAA that says you've got to keep all this stuff really confidential. Now think about the average college student in her third year of her program with a backpack full of confidential medical records or statements. And she's writing it. That's why they're there is because she's writing these, you know, the, the write-up after the thing. That's not a good place for them. And then imagine the teacher getting these pieces of physical paper and marking them up and then handing them back. That's what they were doing. They basically took their EHR and built in additional functionality so that the teachers can mark up the electronic record, keep everything safe in the HIPAA cloud. And she's emulating something that Adobe did early on to take over the uh, world of digital uh, design. Adobe would give you their products almost for free when you're in college. You need Illustrator? No problem. Five bucks a year. Ten bucks a year, right? Once you get out of school, you find out that it's 400 a year. And by the way, to do your job, you need it. And by the way, you know it. So if you walk into a place and you're the first designer in the door, you say, where's my Adobe Illustrator and all these other tools? And they go, oh, we'll get those for you. So she's pre-training all these SLPs, speech language pathologists, to use her product so that when they get into these small clinics who are mostly manual, they'll say, where's clinic note? So that's one of her strategies. So she also sells to private practices, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. She could be selling to an indirect channel, meaning not directly to the customer and the vendor. Um, or in this case, or an assisted sale, meaning somebody's getting compensated for helping her get a deal. She's not doing that today, but just know there are things like value-added resellers that add value to your product and provide it on through. Uh, there's referral and recommendation marketing, this whole social media influencer marketing thing is a great example of referral marketing. And it works in many cases, especially in vertical markets. If there's a very famous SLP and that woman talks about how great Clinic Note is, is, is that's going to drive a lot of traffic to your website and purchases, and you may be wanting to compensate her for that. That goes on. 
So universities, the average contract value for a university, and this is actually roughly true, she's pretty public about this and speaks about it, is $6,700 a year. So the university is paying about $6,700 a year for these tools, for the teachers and students. Uh, it's paid up front, cash in advance, what a wonderful business model. Uh, and there's no really direct cost of sales. There's certainly people's time and energy to make phone calls, and we'll talk more about the sell cycle. But she's not spending dollars, hard dollar cash on her bank account to get a sale. The private practices, the average customer value is, or contract value is about $150 a month if they're monthly, and about $1,200 a year if they're yearly per person. So if you have five people in a practice, it's $6,000 a year, 12 times five. So this is the university sell cycle. Let's say on day one, we give a prospect demo and they give they're, they're really excited and about 30 days later, 40 days later, they come back and go, okay, everybody in the departments approved this, which thankfully the departments make this decision, not the, the board or the college, so we don't have to go through all that. And then she goes through two reviews that take most of the time. IT's review to make sure that it is HIPAA compliant, it meets all the internal university policies and procedures, it, you know, uses single sign-on and all these technical things that the university requires, and, and there's a lot of it. The, main, the, the documentation she has to have available for the way she responds to HIPAA standards is 150 pages that she and her husband wrote. Okay, it's a pretty serious document. Uh, and then there's contract review, where you go to the legal department with this contract that's been provided. She has a standard template uh, that I believe Brown might get, but it doesn't really matter. And she sends that to each university, and every one of them marks it up. Every one of them changes something. It's just, uh, one of our friends calls it adding value. Um, they feel the need to add a little value, so they find something and they mark it up. And then it has to come back to the law firm in town who has to approve the markups. It takes time. That has a little bit of cost in it. Then they onboard the university, which means training the people. Thankfully, onboard is an automated process. It's all self-serve videos, and it's, it's really, really slick the way they've done it. They still do support over the phone, but they never physically call on their customer. They never travel to a customer site for any reason during the sale. So everything's done remote. And then, after all that, 30 or 60 days later, the university gets around to send them a check. So the days across the top, 180 days. That's pretty average for an aggressive, quick university. Uh, that is a quick sale. We had one the other day that called up and said, yeah, we changed our mind, we're not going to do it until next year. There's no, it, there's no real motivation to do it right away. Um, so this is the financial model that traits to this university direct sales. So up here you'll notice, first of all, that even though we're selling $6,000 contracts once a month, we're getting $6,500. This is our cash flow statement. Now, every month, $6,500 comes in. Up here, you'll notice there really isn't any revenue. And that's come something called revenue recognition. We'll get into it more, more in a bit. But basically, revenue recognition means you can't count the revenue for a whole year in month one. Now, if you're selling an app, it's a little different. It's like I paid five bucks, I paid five bucks. But if you're spending $10,000, and you're getting $10,000, you have to account for it one twelfth of $10,000 every month as revenue. That's the way the accounting standards work. So what you'll notice here is, obviously the, the revenue coming through is only $42,500, even though the cash coming through is puts you more like $72,000. Cash flow is immediately positive. And again, this doesn't account for all that time she spent selling, but immediately her cash goes up, so it's a nice model. Private practice, totally different. Demo on day one, verbal yes on day three, installation day four, practice pays 30 days after they're installed. Literally call on a Monday, install and done on a Wednesday, check in 30 days, or in some cases just put it on a credit card, don't worry about it so they get the cash right away. Nice model. So it's because of the private practice. Most private practices are run by one person, and it's primarily ladies. One lady who runs the practice has four or five uh, SLP's working for her, and she's just like, yes or no. And we'll get in a room, they do the demo, do we want to do this, yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, it's done. And Christine, I would imagine your team is like that. You guys get together, you make a decision, and you just, it's a yes or no, you move on. Okay. So it's the average private practice sale. There will be referrals and value added resellers at some point, but right now she's doing it with herself. She has actually a team of three. What's at the top of this sheet is the forecast. This is again made up. One license in January, three new licenses in February, six licenses in March, 10 in April, et cetera, et cetera. Now look what happens all of a sudden down here. These are the renewal sales. 
So this is monthly. Well, when she got 15 new ones in May, she also had 18 removals because they're paying every month. Every month they're dipping the credit card for the 150 bucks. And that's where it starts to really add up because by the time you're out here in November and you have 18 new sales because it is holidays, nobody really wants to do this, or December, you've got 140 or 150 renewals coming through. And that's the magic of a reoccurring uh, revenue stream. If you can get people to like what you're doing and stick with it, um, it suddenly your, your new revenue is just kind of like icing on the top. No pun intended, Christine. <laughs> Um, cash flow goes up immediately. There's, it's just immediate cash. Again, especially if you're on a credit card. Yeah, you give up 3.x percent for the credit card fees, but you get paid right away. That's a very, very nice place to be. So, quick note, it's about sell cycle. Everybody underestimates this. I'm just going to tell you right now, whatever you think your sell cycle is, multiply it by three. And if you're, if you're wrong and it's quicker, wonderful. But this can take a long, long time. This is what's kind of perverse. Sometimes the earliest deals are way faster to happen than most of the deals. You'd think, oh, the earliest ones are the hardest ones to get, right? Your very first customer. Not true, because what's going to happen is it's very likely your earliest deal is a real innovative kind of person. And in fact, at Clinic Note, the first university that bought this product gave a verbal yes on the trade show floor. So when can we install it? Let's go. Let's do it now. The woman who made the decision had the authority to make the decision, had the money to make the decision, and basically didn't worry about what IT or legal thought. She just did it. Okay, she's a bit of a rebel. That's okay. The problem is, now that she's got a bunch of universities, and I think she has 36 now, 26 or 37, I don't remember the number, um, now she's into the more uh, mainstream. Well, I'm not really sure. And they talked to Shara, and, and Jim over at IT's got another question. Can you call Jim for me? I mean, I'm serious. This is what happened. So, that first one may be non-reflective of what the norm is going to be. And that's common across the board with things. Uh, in the world of marketing to people, you've got people or businesses, early adopters, the, the middle, and then the laggards. And you never want to sell the laggards. It's just a waste of your time. <laughs> if you're selling the laggards, you're in trouble. Um, just different customers have different sell cycles. Uh, universities and large organizations tend to be process-bound and very slow. It comes to the territory. Get private practice, make a decision today. Okay, so let's switch gears. Sports Knowledge, fictitious company. The idea here is it's a mobile app developer selling a very serious app for sports fans. They sell it direct through the App Store, Google, and the Android Store, uh, or Google Android Store and the App, Apple Store. They get a $4.95 a month subscription. That's what they get, five bucks a month, basically. Apple and Google take 30%, right off the top. Uh, sounds like a lot. You can say it is, you can say it isn't, but when you got a billion customers showing up in your app store, it's a lot of marketing money. You try marketing without it. Um, they're paying the credit card fees, they're taking care of all of that. So there is some value there. We'll talk about Amazon in a minute as well. They're kind of like that. Um, so Apple and Google take 30%. So app store sales, the, the, the sell cycle, you know, once your app is out there, assuming you can drive people to go download your app, assuming people want to do that, that's a different piece. They're going to be buying every day. And the way Apple and Google work is they pay you once a month. You've got to meet a minimum, like 25 bucks or something, but then they transfer money to your checking account. Uh, they vary slightly from each other, but it's pretty much the same game. They pay once a month. So again, on the App Store sales, this is a pretty, uh, what I've done up here is I've just done a forecast of how many new licenses, and then you'll see the renewals. Now you'll notice that not everybody renews. I set a renewal rate of like 80% or something, because especially in the app business, not everybody renews their apps. And when you're building your model, you have to figure out what's my renewal rate. And this is true of physical products. The people are buying like a, a consumable product. How many are going to renew? How many are going to keep buying? Do I keep buying the same toilet paper every month? Or do I change brands, right? You can't assume everybody that bought Charmin last year is going to buy Charmin this year. It doesn't work out. You've got to keep adding new customers to fill in the ones that fell out. So if you just look at the model just in general, $15,000 worth of revenue, 15599 the the sales expense, which is really the, the Google or Amazon, $35.59, that's the most of your expenses. Now, I don't have other expenses in here. I'm just trying to show you just the revenue impacts. I'm trying not to keep all the other, or add on all the other stuff to it. But you just get a, a sense for, for how that works out uh, of a decent amount of income. On the cash flow side, uh, cash positive right away. You can see the change in cash across the bottom. Um, Again, just forecasting about how many, they, I want you to look at the numbers at the top. July, 1,234 licenses. I mean, that's a lot to sell. 
just keep that in mind. When you're selling something that's five bucks, you've got to do a lot because somewhere in here you've got to pay yourself. And this is all prepaying yourself. This is just what's my revenue model, what's my cost of getting that revenue. So I think these are very deceptively simple models. Marketing's a challenge. At the end of the day, it's all about marketing. It's all about buzz. Um, I know you're in the gaming business. You know, if you can sell five million copies of your game, you're in great shape. I don't care what it costs to vote, but if you can't sell 5,000 a year at a reasonable price, you probably don't have a business. And it's just the challenge with, with a low cost product. It means volume, which means marketing. Well, and those renewal rates at the front end, it's, it's kind of a... It's a guess. Just a guess, right? Maybe it is, but you, you know, you can learn. I've gone out and looked at, I've Googled things. Google's your friend. You know, what's the average renewal rate on a uh, paid email app? And you'll get some people's blog posts. Well, you know, we're at this company, we saw this kind of renewal rate, we saw this at this company. Ask people that are doing something complementary to what you do that's in a similar business model, a lot of them will tell you. I imagine you know your follow up rate on customers. Yes. And I'll bet the other firms know it, and I'll bet you guys might even talk about it over a beer. So it's, it's pretty much you can ask. Um, there are some industry standards, there's some uh, knowledge in different uh, financial databases on renewals. Uh, that you can find on bigger companies, the problem is it's going to be usually bigger companies. And no, you don't know to begin with. Shoot low, assume your renewal rate won't be as good as you hope it is. 